Today we're going to talk about a clinical case situation and some strategies you might use to manage the situation if you see this in your practice. We're focusing on PIP joint dislocations, as I've just said, a very common injury. In the PIP joint, a very important thing to remember is the natural history of the disorder is towards stiffness, not instability. The immediate reaction when we talk about a dislocation is that the joint is forever going to be dislocating. And that's true for some joints, but not the PIP joint. It's very commonly injured. Often we don't know about it, but they do tend to get very stiff if they're not managed well. The joint is very complicated. There are a lot of support structures which make sure that the PIP joint only moves in an axial flexion and extension and not side to side. So the collateral supports are very strong. There's also the complexity of the extensor hood and the volar flexor tendons, all passing across the joint at this level. Looking in another view, the PIP joint is here, we can see again strong collateral ligament structures, not anatomically perfect for all the anatomists out there, but it gives the idea collateral supports stopping that side to side movement and this strong volar plate or volar ligament, which we'll talk about in a moment. The PIP joint is made up of the proximal phalanx, then the middle phalanx, just beyond here is distal for the sake of the representation. And in this PIP joint here are these support structures, the collaterals, the accessory collaterals, and the volar plate. Now the volar plate attaches very firmly right here. When this joint is injured, and it's very common in sports, blows to the end of the finger with a ball, they cause hyperextension, and this ligament will rupture. Sometimes it pulls a flake of bone away with it, other times it just ruptures. We'll be able to see this on the x-ray in a moment. In either case, the end result is a loss of continuity here of the volar plate. This will then allow the dislocation dorsally once the support structures are gone. Intuitively, also some of the collateral structures will be gone, but often not all. In terms of investigations, rarely is it required that we do more than a plain x-ray. Sometimes an ultrasound may be useful, but in general, the history and examination and a plain x-ray will tell the story. They will have sustained a blow to the digit, causing hyperextension and a dislocation, and our x-ray may or may not show an avulsion fracture. If the bony alignment is normal and there's no fracture, we can assume a PIP joint injury involves the volar plate to some degree. With that in mind, our rehabilitation progresses the same. Complex investigations like MRI are not useful and will simply show us the damage we know is there. So a plain X-ray and a good history and examination will get us 95% of the way there. If the injury is complicated or unusual, Referral to a specialist is a good idea. The management is mostly in the rehabilitation and ensuring that things are going along as we expected. An MRI or something complicated may be indicated later on if the injury is not behaving the way we want it to. Our x-ray then will look like this. This is a dorsal dislocation of the middle phalanx on the proximal phalanx. These images show what it looks like when a small flake of bone is avulsed with the volar plate. Here, only minimally. And in this picture here, a more significant avulsion. In both circumstances, however, the joint is in good alignment. In these images, we see a more severe injury with an avulsion of a significant portion of bone. We also see some dorsal subluxation of the joint. This is a more complicated problem. In the other image for reference, we see a much more rare volar dislocation, again with an avulsion. We won't be talking about this today, but it's important to know the difference between a volar and a dorsal dislocation. When we look at these images, there is a tendency to be concerned about this fracture, but they will often heal. And as I've said a couple of times, many of these injuries we never see. Our initial treatment will involve splinting. These will heal. We can see in many of those avulsion fractures that the volar plate structure is sitting in good position. 
Even when there's not a bony flake, we know the volar plate's still there and it will reattach itself. We want to be sure to protect the joint from that hyperextension because in the early days it will be unstable. So a dorsal blocking splint is important. The natural history though is towards stiffness and if we leave them in a splint for a number of weeks, it will be difficult to get them moving again. If they're splinted in full extension, they will remain stiff in extension. If they're splinted into a degree of flexion, they will develop a flexion contracture at the PIP joint. Both of these are then difficult to reverse. So the key is a dorsal blocking splint, which stops the joint from hyperextending and allows the volar plate to heal. And then range of motion exercises into flexion against the blocking splint. Surgery is rarely required and only if severe. We saw a picture there where the joint was actually subluxed dorsally and when unstable like that, a surgical procedure may be indicated. Intuitively, the more joint is involved, the more it's a surgical problem. My advice there would be if there's any significant damage or signs of dorsal dislocation, they should be looked at by a surgeon. Even with a non-surgical rehabilitation, we can expect symptoms in this joint for six to nine months. They're very uncomfortable, we use them every day, and patients are often distressed when the joint is still sore at four or six months post-injury. It's not uncommon, and we need to counsel them that it's normal. So initially we'll start with a dorsal blocking splint at 10 degrees, moving in range of motion. They'll progress to buddy straps just taping to the finger next door after about four weeks, and then continue to manage with an extension splint at night if required, all the way out until there's no further development of contracture. So there's a very rapid summary of these PIP joint dislocations. In general, if there's minimal or no displacement of the joint with a small avulsion fracture in position, therapy is the key to rehabilitation. We won't go into the details of surgical reconstruction today. So there you have it. A very common injury causing disruption of the volar plate. If not managed with range of motion, that volar plate will stick down and scar, causing contracture of the digit in the position that it's left. Early range of motion and dorsal blocking are the key. And if there's significant destruction or displacement of the joint, surgical referral may lead to surgical intervention. Let us know if you have any questions. That's a very short summary into what is a very intriguing injury and can often cause a lot of problems. I'll be glad to talk to you soon.